Knowing that she has a tour de force ready for us, I've been asked to dispense from a lengthy introduction, since everybody in this room no doubt knows who Janet Smith is. If you don't, I invite you to Google Janet Smith and Humane Vitae, since in the United States their names are often associated with each other in her great defense all these many years of Blessed Paul VI encyclical. So Janet Smith, everyone. I'm going to talk here about the new challenges uh, to humani vitae. And they are largely centered around the concepts of conscience and discernment. And we have to get used to understanding these words honestly in very different ways from what they've been meant uh, in the tradition. The challenge, of course, comes from the group of theologians who have for decades been known uh, as revisionists. At least that's their, their preferred term in the last couple decades. Before that, they called themselves uh, dissenters and proportionalists and even consequentialists. They're still using revisionists, though I suspect that's going to fade and there's going to be some new term. I, I might help them out here today, but um, <laughs> no, I have a very benign term. Um, and these really are the interpreters of Amoris Laetitia. Right? And I'm going to call them the discerners. Right? There's a slight echo of dissent in there, right? discerners. Right? And I am I'm not evaluating the legitimacy of their interpretation of the Morris Laetitia. It's open to many different interpretations. I'm going to be talking about one that is being used by the revisionists to advance a certain um, development, really, in moral theology. Now, just briefly on what has been the revisionist response to Humani Vitae, the current leader, I would say, of the revisionist movement is probably James Keenan of Boston College. And he talks about Humani Vitae as having stymied the advances of the revisionist project. And that project was to overcome the legalism of the manuals. Some of you have heard that already today, but for, for maybe a couple centuries, um, there were the manuals that were, were legalistic, even the great, uh, not, I shouldn't say even the great, but the great uh, Father Pinkers had as a project uh, overturning the legalism of um, the manuals and getting a more personalistic, more Christocentric, more scripturally based understanding of moral uh, theology. But the way in which James Keenan thought uh, Humane Vitae stymied the advances of revisionism is he actually thinks that it's returned to a kind of legalism. And even more so, it's problematic in that if it, it, elevated the pope and the magisterium over theologians, right? So as whereas before the theologians were the authorities for what church teaching was on moral matters, now Humane Vitae, and really they acknowledge that Pius XII did an enormous amount in this direction, um, they elevated the pope and the magisterium as the authoritative teachers. And they claimed that uh, Humane Vitae usurped the proper role of theologians who were more learned than the, theolo than the Pope and the Magisterium. So now we're having to bow to sort of a, a less learned group of individuals as opposed to um, the learned theologians. Now as much as they disliked the manualists, they did like the fact that the theologians in the manuals were treated as the authorities. And it allowed for more diversity in views. That's very important, of course, that word diversity. In the manuals, you would read that some theologians think this, other theologians think that, this is more probable or more probable than probable, and equally probable, all right? And so you could choose, in a sense. You didn't have this absolutely dogmatic authority. You had some diversity. And so it, they very much want to return to the theologians being the authorities and um, allowing for a large degree of diversity. Now the old challenges to Humane Vitae was the claim that it was based on an inadequate understanding of natural law. It was essentialist, static, and deductive. Those are all bad, bad things to be, okay? It wasn't true to the experience of married couples. It needed to adopt proportionalism. But one of the most delightful things I discovered in my reading this year is that proportionalists, <laughs> such as Father Charles Curran, um, say that proportionalism is dead, right? It's, it's, they, it's no longer a concern. Uh, 
that we now have a multiplicity of possibilities. Virtue ethics, feminist ethics, third world ethics, we have all sorts of a diversity. So we don't need something, an overarching principle of methodology. It wasn't received, right? The Catholic faithful aren't living by it. It was not infallible. And it didn't respect, sorry, it didn't respect consciences. Now, all of these things we can expect to be resurrected in this next year, as those are going to be uh, those who reject humani vitae. But it, these, aren't, these are not going to be major. These are not going to be major at all. It's, it's more a resurrection of the authority of the conscience, but even more importantly, it's a very different understanding of what the conscience is. All right, that's what we have to very much catch. So just in a general sense, the interpreters or the discerners of, who read Amoris Laetitia say that, we, that they find a development in moral theology in Amoris Laetitia, and the development, they say, is pastoral, not doctrinal. That's why they don't have to do the other stuff, because we're not changing doctrine at all. We're just changing how we apply doctrine. We're not even applying doctrine, believe me. We're just helping consciences discern. That's what we're doing. So we don't need to refute the arguments that defend humanity vitae because we're not looking for a doctrinal change. Right? We don't have to question the authority of the doctor, document because we're not, it's not a doctrinal matter that we're pushing here. We're pushing a pastoral uh, approach to these issues. So substantive matters are now irrelevant. All right? They're irrelevant. So they read Amoris Laetitia in light of a psychological view of conscience. And this is key. One without naturally known moral norms. Right? I'll review very briefly the traditional view of conscience. And it's very different from the philosophical, theological view of conscience of the church. Right? So here are some of the passages. I, I invite you to go back to Amoris Laetitia and then read some of these later with the new understanding of conscience I hope I succeed in laying out. A, a early passage in Amoris Laetitia says, we also find it hard to make room for the consciences of the faithful who very often respond as best they can to the gospel amid their limitations and are capable of carrying out their own discernment in complex situations. So it's the conscience of the faithful who respond as best they can. We've been called to form consciences, not to replace them. Now, of course the church says we shouldn't replace consciences, but what does it mean to form consciences? The document later says the individual conscience needs to be <clears throat> better incorporated into the church's proxies in certain situations which do not objectively embody our understanding of marriage. Again, a, a true primacy of conscience here. It says, conscience can do more than recognize that a given situation does not correspond objectively to the overall demands of the gospel. It can also recognize with sincerity and honesty what, for now, is the most generous response which can be given to God, and come to see with a certain moral security that that is what God himself is asking. He's just asking us to do our best amid the concrete complexity of one's limit, while yet not fully the objective ideal. And the ideal here is what's always been called the norm, right? Not just some, something that's really, you know, becoming Michael Jordan or something. It's, it's been considered do not murder, right? And that's here basically called an objective ideal. In any event, let us recall that this discernment is dynamic. It must remain ever open to new stages of growth and to new decisions which can establish the ideal to be more fully realized. At some time, you might grow into being able to follow the commandments. But right now, just do the best that you can. That's how the discerners are reading it. So the conclusions of the discerners are this. We must accompany consciences, really much more than form them. We must accompany them. We must not impose external norms. That's just about as bad as you can be. Objective norms are ideals, not what God is asking in all circumstances. Veritatis splendor actually is passe. In Amoris Laetitia, we have a paradigm shift. So let's briefly look at the traditional view of conscience, which is tied to natural law. The conscience has two jobs. 
One is the cinderesis or cinderesis, and the conscious is a kind of repository of the natural law. There we hold truths derived from natural law and commands, such as human life has infinite value. We think everyone should know that, and everyone should be able to derive from that, that it's wrong to deliberately take an innocent human life, and we should quickly understand the command, do not murder. These things are naturally and easily known. The conscience also judges antecedently or consequently whether one's action is in accord with objective goods, right? Objective goods, not internal values, as we'll see. The traditional understanding of natural law is the human person's participation in eternal law, and that's a great part of our dignity. It's the human person's ability to know objective moral norms, and we know these from our understanding of human nature that we get from reflection on natural inclinations, from experience, from being taught, from observation, and it's confirmed by church teaching. These norms are in accord with our nature and dignity, and thus they should be welcomed by us, not felt like these are terrible impositions of, of a bossy god. Right. We believe there's universal immutable moral norms because human nature is universal and immutable, because scripture teaches it is. There are such things. It's taught in the catechism, and the very taught of splendor, and in every magisterial document about morality. And there's a lot of cross-cultural evidence that rape is always wrong, murder is always wrong, etc. This is from a few passages from Veritatis Splendor that very well express the traditional view. The dignity of this rational form, the conscience, and the authority of its voice, and judgments derived from the truth about moral good and evil, which it is called to listen to and to express. This truth is indicated by the divine law, the universal and objective norm of morality. It comes from God, this voice within. Right? It's attractive to us. The judgment of conscience does not establish the law, rather it bears witness to the authority of the natural law and the practical reason with reference to the supreme good. I love this phrase, whose attractiveness the human person perceives and whose commandments he accepts. When we hear that in human life has infinite value, we say that's, that's a very attractive thought. You shouldn't t take innocent human life. Well, that's, I'm attracted to that, <laughs> so I shouldn't murder. He also says this beautiful thing about obedience. He says, conscience is not an independent and exclusive capacity to decide what is good and what is evil. Rather, there is profoundly imprinted upon it a principle of obedience vis-a-vis -vis the objective norm, which establishes and conditions the correspondence of its decisions with the commands and prohibitions which are at the basis of human behavior. It's very interesting. We, John Paul II talks a lot about this in Veritatis Splendor. We have a natural um, love of the truth. And we also know that if there is truth about something, we are obliged to obey that truth. We don't think, oh, it doesn't matter that there's truth. If we hear that someone, you know, I just the few examples I give my students. If we find out that someone's been um, spent years in prison for a can't, for a crime he didn't commit, we don't say, "Oh well, no big deal." There's no such thing as truth. There's no such thing as justice. It's just kind of unlucky. Or aren't we outraged? Or if a politician lies to us, we're outraged because we believe we're owed the truth. So how do we form conscience? Well, I'm not going to read this one, but it, it, the, the conscience is really a matter. It's a, forming it is we, well, I will read it. It says it better than I do. As, as its departure point, the formation of conscience requires being enlightened about these things. God's project of love for every single person, the positive and liberating value of the moral law, and awareness both of the weakness caused by sin and the means of grace which strengthens us on our path towards the good and towards salvation. So God loves us. He gives us these laws because he loves us. We might have difficulty because of, because of our sinfulness, but grace will help us obey God's laws. All very profound. It sounds easy, but it's all incredibly profound. Now let's look at the interpreters of Amoris Laetitia's understanding of conscience. They consider it the self as formed by one's own history. And really, a major source of this is Father Bernard Herring, the famous redemptorist uh, moral theologian. He was one of the fathers of modern moral theology. He wrote the three-volume epical work, Free and Faithful in Christ. He stressed the creative and prophetic role of conscience. 
It's not something the church talks a lot about, the creative and prophetic role of conscience. Actually, he worked closely with Carol Wojtyla on Gaudium et Spes. I'll show you some interesting parts of that as we go along here. Now, the Amoris Laetitia, or discerner's view of conscience, it is, it is not the repository of moral norms known through natural law. So when you're appealing to the conscience, you are not appealing to natural law. It's the self molded by one's history, one's choices. It's more the repository of moral values, not moral laws or goods, but moral values that the person has committed to through a lifetime. Right? So moral norms then are viewed as akin to the superego of psychologists. They're the heteronymous norms, norms imposed externally, not the internal norms that you have because you're made in the image and likeness of God and the natural law that you know, but instead they're external and they're being imposed upon me. You can get them from your parents or from the state or from the culture or from the church, right? And they impede, if not prevent, authenticity, which is the most important thing, and moral maturation. So they take these passages from Amoris Laetitia to suggest that insisting on any norm, even the norms of the church or natural law, uh, is very bad uh, for helping a person be morally authentic and to mature. This is a passage they point to as supporting their view. A pastor cannot feel that it's enough simply to apply moral laws to those living in irregular situations, as if they were stones to throw at people's lives. This would bespeak the closed heart of one used to hiding behind the church's teachings, sitting on the chair of Moses and judging at times with superiority and superficiality difficult cases and wounded families. So if you insist upon the commandments, it's like throwing stones at people. Talk, here's the way they talk about natural law. They said, along these same lines, the International Theological Commission has noted that natural law could not be presented as an already established set of rules that impose themselves a priori. Commandments could be seen as a priori rules imposed on people. Rather, it's a source of objective inspiration, ideals, for the deeply personal process of making decisions. So moral norms aren't determinative of what you can do or can't do. They're kind of an inspiration that might guide your moral decisions. It says further, discernment may help to find possible ways of responding to God and growing in the midst of limits. By thinking that everything is black and white, we sometimes close off the way of grace and growth and discourage paths of sanctification which give glory to God. So we, norms squeeze us in, and they don't allow us to be creative and prophetic and to grow. All right? Now, some of these practices uh, are good pastoral practices in limited contexts. You hear this phrase a lot, you've got to start where people are. All right? Yeah, sometimes it is right to start where a person is. Sometimes it is right to practice the law of gradualness. Many priests find this constant with dealing with people who come from marriage preparation who are already cohabiting. I know of none of them that have sort of said, you're a terrible, miserable, mortal sinner and you're going to hell unless you immediately separate. I've never heard of that, right? Most of them let it sit for a while until they help them understand the church's teaching on marriage, maybe several sessions before they get down to the nitty gritty on what's wrong with their current situation and what they should do to rectify it before they get married. They don't immediately require an engaged couple to stop cohabiting, but it is not because their consciences are the right place to start. Right? They don't even know how to access their consciences. That's what we're assuming. We have, to get, we have to do some work here to teach them how to access the conscience and how to hear God's voice. We do it rather to build trust so that you can lead them to accept church teaching. So that's a gradualness, that's the law of gradualness, right? But they take this pastoral practice as being what it is, is everything about um, mentoring or formation, is trying to get people in touch with themselves and don't try to move them too far from where they are because that would be imposing 
external laws upon them, right? Not that you would lose trust, but that you would be imposing external laws upon them. The discerners make a difference, oh my gosh, they make a, different, a distinction between the right decision versus a good decision. And it's better to make good decisions than the right ones, right? The discerner's natural law does not include universal immutable norms. It considers itself dynamic, experiential, historical, and cultural. It's gradually discovered, and it could change if the cultural changes. So there's no absolute immortal norms. They talk about, Bernard Hearing talks about natural law in this way. It's unthinkable to tell people in the church or outside the church to ignore their own conscience in favor of certain formulations of the natural law. Since natural law is not the legislation of any human authority, but it's the sincerity of man searching the truth, the inner impulse to follow one's own sincere conviction. So if these discerners tell you we believe in natural law and we believe that people should follow the natural law, what they mean by natural law is that I, I do want to be sincere. I do want to seek the truth. And I say, well, if, if my truth is this, then that's what I should follow because I want to be sincere. So if they say something like, yes, you should follow the natural law, they don't have our understanding of the natural law as a participation in God's law and different norms. That's not it at all. It's your desire to follow the truth. The right decision, they say there is such a thing as a right decision. It's the objectively right choice, the ideal. I don't know exactly what that is for them, but I'm supposing it's the choice in accord with the dynamic natural law, whatever that is, right? It's not of foremost importance. It is more important to make a good decision. So I make a distinction. The right decision is, let's say, thou shalt not commit adultery. But that's not necessarily the good decision. That's the right decision. The good decision is the decision that is in conformity with the values to which one has committed oneself. That's the good decision, being authentic. It's the authentic, sincere decision. The cohabitor who says, I couldn't separate. This would be an abandonment. It would be unkind. It would be this. So I have to continue to cohabit. That's what I sincerely and authentically believe. And if we were to say, but that's not what the church teaches, that would be trying throwing stones at the person and, and imposing external laws. It's the choice for which one takes full responsibility because it's freely chosen. It involves no submission or obedience. Right? Those are bad things, submission and obedience, because you're not being true to yourself. You're saying, well, the church made me do it, as opposed to saying, I'm doing what I can take responsibility for, my own choices. But if I stop cohabiting, I'm doing it because the church says I should. So I'm not being fully free and responsible. All right? The moral agent should be encouraged to be creative and may, in fact, be prophetic. We may learn from such people, right, that they're being guided, right? Otherwise, if you don't do this, you do violence to yourself. Why? Because sub to submit or obey norms that one has not personally accepted is to abdicate one's freedom and to shift responsibility to the source of the norms. Okay, the church made me do it. Um, to mature morally, to mature morally, one has to take responsibility for one's own choices. And the possibility of creativity and prophecy are closed off. Uh, just there's, let's look at Gaudium et Spes. St. John the Paul II, he's, it's interesting, the followers of John Paul II think he basically wrote this passage and it reflects his views. The followers of Bernard Herring thinks this passage reflect, that he wrote this passage, and they reflect his views. I was stunned when I was uh, discovering this. Classic view of conscience. In the depths of his conscience, man detects a law which he does not impose upon himself, but which holds him to obedience. Always summoning him to love good and ev avoid evil, the voice of conscience, when necessary, speaks to his heart, do this, shun that. For man has in his heart a law written by God, to obey it is the very dignity of man. According to it, he will be judged. Conscience is the most secret core and sanctuary of a man. There he is alone with God, whose voice echoes in his depths. We can see all the traditional natural law theory, I think, right there. But just go back to, down, down to the last three lines there. This is very much what the uh, discerners emphasize. Conscience is the most secret and core and sanctuary of a man. There he is alone with God whose voice echoes in his depths. 
So I'm talking to God who can help me find the most generous response I can make to my situation, right? It's not that there's some law inside of me that I don't, that the, the law that I find again here is that I, I want to do the right thing. I seek to be authentic, and that's what law is. And this is an interpretation put forward by a interpreter of Gaudi Metzpes, in this was 1987. She says, Gaudi Metzpes puts forward a model of morality in which the person is the source of ethical discernment and action, which the person is, not the natural law. In so doing, it initiates a move towards a new paradigm, this is 1987, one that emphasizes personal responsibility rather than obedience, okay? So a company for the discerners means helping the agent to recognize what values have oriented his decisions. It means helping the agent act in accord with the best of those values, though no, accord, no criteria are given <laughs> for how to order those values. How, would I know, how can I help a person find the best values unless we have some sort of ordering of values? And this is, this is an amazing passage in Amoris Laetitia. I actually think that's 327. It says AL27. It's probably 327. Moral education entails asking of a child or a young person only those things that do not involve a disproportionate sacrifice and demanding only a degree of effort that will not lead to resentment or coercion. Try to get a teenager out of bed with that principle. <laughs> Ordinarily, this is done by proposing small steps that can be understood, accepted, and appreciated while including a proportionate sacrifice. Otherwise, by demanding too much, we gain nothing, right? So we don't ask people to do big sacrificial things. I say, Jesus didn't get this memo, all right? Um, <laughs> you know, uh, in very taught to splendor, John Paul II does a great deal with the rich young man who says, what must I do to gain eternal life? And what does Jesus say? He threw stones at him. He said, follow the commandments. And then he said, even more demanding, give away your possessions and follow me. He, and the rich young man walked away. And Jesus didn't say, well, let's, let's wait, 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 wait. What's the most generous response you can give here, All right? And it, this, this not recognizing the force of the natural law that we have inside of us, I think it cripples, it cripples um, mentoring people. I had a young man many years ago, a prom, prom going student at Notre Dame. He came by my office, he was going off to Chicago where he had reserved a hotel room to share with his date, which they all did, and of course they were going to have sex. And being the, I don't know what adjective I want to use here, bold, obnoxious, whatever, I said, that's J.S. is me, am I right to conclude that you intend to have sex? I asked him that. He said, mm, <laughs> yes, <laughs> okay. And I said, you know, that's wrong, don't you? And he said, hmm, yes I do. What do I do now? I said, well, there's a priest on every corner at Notre Dame. Go find one and go to confession. I said, and call up the girl and tell her you're getting a, a private room for her and that you're not having sex. And I said, and call me and tell me you did that. And he did, right? <laughs> now, yeah. But, and I've heard, I've heard people who leave my talk on contraception and on their way out, they tell me they take their contraceptives out of their purse and put it in the garbage can. Now, why is that? Because they have something in them that the truth is there. And I'm res what I'm saying is, is alivening that truth, right? And it's already in them, and I have confidence if they're baptized, that natural law is especially there, right? And don't hesitate. You have to be obviously wise and, and know who to say it to. I knew this young man, and I knew that he knew, and that's why I could say it to him. I didn't have to pussyfoot at all. I knew he knew. Right? He was just going along with the crowd. So, to return to the question of criteria. They don't think there are any universal, absolute, immutable norms, no naturally known moral truths. So the question is then, to whom should we turn if we have a question about a moral, moral behavior? Who do we go to? Do we go to an authoritarian, non-expert magisterium, or do we go to prophetic theologians? All right? And this is James Keenan. He says exactly this. He says, we must help persons develop morally mature personalities through becoming self-governing moral subjects. Whereas earlier moralists decided what was right or wrong in every area of life, contemporary moralists are interested 
in helping subjects rightly realize their moral truth. Right, so you have to, we have to be very clear that when they're, we keep reading these passages, and again, I don't know, I'm not here to say what Amoris Laetitia really means, but I want to say how they're understanding it, the discerners and interpreters are understanding it, and how it's going to be applied, and they're already applying it to Humani Vitae. Clearly, if, if couples think this is the mo that using contraception is the most generous response they can offer to God, and that's the, the living in accord with their values, we need to honor that. Right? And that's the good thing to do. We're not bothered too much about what the right thing to do is, because the most important thing to do is the good thing. Thank you.